So we turn now to the fourth major topic of this module, which is social cognition. You may think of cognition as something that necessarily or probably belongs in the head. If you do so, you are buying into a whole bunch of quite popular accounts of cognition that delineate something called the cognitive realm of the individual. But I hope we've learned to be a bit cautious about accepting any one framework as ultimately authoritative here. The relationship between any psychology of the person, any personal psychology, and our understanding of what the human social world is um, can be interrogated. There are those who would insist that they're simply different. That is, what goes on inside you should be characterized in terms familiar from psychology, like memory and attention and so on. And that the social then happens or arises when people equipped in this fashion interact. That's to introduce a strong divide where we really need to be a bit more cautious. We've met this several times before. We've met the idea that nature and nurture or nature and culture or biology and culture can be cleanly separated. We've interrogated those and found those to be far more complex than any such simplistic division would supply. And that's what we find in cognitive science as we address questions of knowing. We make things easier for ourselves when we split the cosmos in this way. We met Descartes doing it, but we do it all the time in our discussions. Perhaps we need to do it, but perhaps we need to be cautious as we do it as well. So at the beginning of this module, I said we will recurrently meet these kinds of oppositions, mind versus matter, the mental versus the physical, nature and nurture, culture and nature, the symbolic order of mere symbols versus the causal order unfolding according to the laws of physics and perhaps biology. Are they the same? Questions of value and meaning and significance, which contrast with questions of bare existence. These contrasts are not simple. None of them is simple. Most of our stories for particular purposes will rely on some kind of partitioning, but we need to be careful. Psychological theories describe the mind of an individual as beautifully portrayed in the statue of the thinker. And we've met this concern before. If we adopt this stance, and this is a stance we can do to adopt or not to adopt, then we create something called a psychological subject with borders more or less like this. Cognition as some poorly defined thing in the middle. Sensation giving rise to perception as inputs and action plans giving rise to behavior as outputs. This is the cognitivist view, which finds general acceptance and its construction has been tied together with the construction of the individual in other domains. The manner in which we accord human rights, the manner in which we um, essentialize questions of sex and gender, um, the manner in which we understand <clears throat> personal responsibility, the fundamental unit of democracy, the voting citizen, are all tied to this. So this has emerged over several hundred years. And we need to remember that we made this this partitioning of an environment out there and a cognitive domain in here. Now, the two major schools of approach here differ greatly, of course. On the left, we see the representational view in which the cognizing subject, shown as a little man there, a little guy, I think, um, builds or constructs a representation internally of a world that's external. On embodied cognitive accounts, we don't meet that. We see instead a, an embodied being embedded in a specific environment, but the environment is not inside the being. The being is inside the environment. And when we start to consider the issues that arise here now, we need to be very self-conscious about what your environment is or my environment. When I say the word environment, 
A lot of associations come to mind that are not helpful. We are not talking here about forests and trees and deserts, unless you happen to live in the forest or a tree or a desert. This is the environment in which you find yourself in UCD, at least in pre-COVID days. What you see is a bunch of surfaces, physical surfaces that have been made for humans. Every physical element of this view here has been self-consciously constructed in order to facilitate human going on. Walking around UCD is nothing like walking through a jungle. And so in some respects, the physical environment has been trivialized so that it's not a problem, so that handles and steps appear when we need to open doors and climb things. The most significant elements of this environment are the other people. They're the ones you pay attention to. This is true for humans generally. The most important element in the environment of a human being is other human beings. Usually, I mean, we might consider the role of the farmer, who has very important relationships to livestock, um, or the hermit. But for most people, most of the time, it's other people that are the elements of the environment to which we are responding with which we are in interaction. Intersubjectivity points to the idea that much of the meaning that we make is consensual and arises in our interaction. And meaning is collectively made. We share a common world to some extent. Um, and we miss that somehow if we place all notion of subjectivity inside the head. Um, place the subject as previously constructed here makes other people a real puzzle. And it sort of pushes us into a position perilously close to solipsism, which nobody wants to occupy. Solipsism, of course, being the bizarre belief that you are the only sentient being in the world. To what extent are other people a puzzle for you that needs to be figured out? Are your relations one of calculation about remote people, people to whom you have no direct access? Is that the basis on which empathy and care for one another arises? And how is it that we come to live in a common world? These questions cannot be addressed by assuming that we are closed systems and everything goes on inside the head. And so we'll explore, as we go on, um, both how people have addressed these questions and also what can go terribly wrong if we trivialize these questions.